Okay, so I'm Terry Ellendorf. I'm also in Forest and Wildlife. That's my main appointment in that department. And I'm going to start off for a few minutes, and then I'm going to be followed by my colleagues. And, and then it's not a matter of questions in the last half hour. We're really hoping that based on the question we asked, what can I best do to help, that you guys will share all your, all your experiences. And the fact that, yeah, this is April, but the point is it's going to happen again, and it's in Nepal. It's going to happen. It is happening in many other places. We've gone through Haiti. We've gone through Katrina. We're, we're hearing all about the re, you know, disaster relief in Katrina 10 years later. So these are really timely. And for all of us who are experts, especially like in area studies, we know particular areas really well. And when things happen, we feel a special obligation to participate and do something, you know, more than maybe an average person. And, and I know when it happened in Nepal in, um, in April, well, before I get into my personal story, so I'm going to have more of a personal perspective, and then we're going to move on to the other two. But I just want to, here's, you know, here's sort of when the earthquake first happened on April 25th. Here's the area that it was in, central Nepal, up in the Himalaya. It didn't happen right in Kathmandu. It happened mainly to the, to the east and then a little bit to the west around it. And there's just so much stuff online, which is part of our talk today. There's so much online you can look at. This is just to give you an idea of the scale. Number of people who died, they estimated, of course, all things are estimated, injured. A fifth of Nepal's 28 million people have been affected, 30 of the 75 districts, you know, hundreds of thousands of homes destroyed, and uh, many people without you know, roofs over their head. And, and surprisingly, many fewer injured than we expected and, and died, right? So in some ways, these are numbers that, that we were sort of happy to see, unfortunately. And then, like we said, this is the one we've been waiting for, especially I feel like maybe it's because, so I worked in Nepal since 1991 when I was Peace Corps. And earthquakes are always in the back of our heads, but never that prominent. In the past couple of years, maybe it's because it's generally becoming something people think about, or because I spent more time in Kathmandu. But all of a sudden, the last couple of years, everyone has the earthquake, has the earthquake of blue buckets. I couldn't find a picture of my friend's house where she has hers in, in Kathmandu. But every every expat was going to trainings. You know, every Nepali who worked for an NGO, especially you know an international one, was going to trainings about earthquakes, and they had these in their yards, and these have tents and food and water in them, so you can get to it when your house collapses in an earthquake. People, you get into a car and just go for a fun hike one day, and they talk about, yeah, I put my earthquake stuff in my car the other day, and I'm all ready. So I just feel like there's a lot more talk. This is over the end of the past year, and then all of a sudden we got one in, in April. But I also want to mention, like, this is not really the one we've been waiting for because we were, were all, there's a, supposedly a lot of pressure building up right around Kathmandu. There's some fault lines that didn't release during this, and I don't know all these, these technicalities and the details. But, you know, it really wasn't the one we've been waiting for, and that's why we actually are happy with the numbers in some ways, that it wasn't as bad as we thought. And, you know, there's going to be more that we're going to have to deal with. Um, and so that's, this is sort of to talk about proactively, how can we think about disasters? Can we talk and think about what we could do? And we don't have the answers here. This is, that's why there's a discussion. But. So I was in Myanmar when it happened, just to give you some of my background in April. So I was down in a place where I actually was in a pretty nice hotel in southern Myanmar doing some work. I'm a conservation biologist. I have no disaster relief experience, no particular expertise, because I know biodiversity. I do know communities and development, so I know a lot about the issues around disaster relief, but not much about it. And I'm sitting there in Myanmar. I see on Facebook people are starting to donate money immediately. Friends are, you know, going out in the field. are going to talk about that a little bit. And you're just thinking, what should I do? Should I send money immediately? Should I be going from straight from Myanmar? You know, a lot of us are dealing with that. What can I do? If I just went, if I flew from here, I'm so close. They need bodies just to do stuff, right? We're all, everyone's asking these questions, right? What should I do? Um, and what should I advise others to do who know I work in Nepal? And they ask me, should I give money? Do they need money? Do they need this? Who should I give money to, right? How to think through all these issues. Um, and then I just, so here's just a couple of things that, you know, in my head, like thinking versus doing. I'm a thinker. This hour is just to think, okay? Some of us are just doers, and we don't need to think so hard. We, we just need to do something, and that's, that's enough, right? Um, my family had a, a disaster about a year ago, and I could see hundreds of volunteers who helped us. For some of them, they don't want to think. They just want to do. They emotionally have to help you, right? So these are very emotional issues, too, and so we all deal with them in very different ways. Um, Helping versus a sense of purpose is a key issue, right? What actually helps and what sort of gives you a sense of purpose? And when you look at a lot of times when people volunteer to do things, they're doing it from a sense of purpose. And it can be pretty hard to be on the receiving end of someone else's sense of purpose, you know? So there's things like that that really come into play. And we have advantages being in academia, being academics, having access to all this information and knowledge about disaster relief and the countries we work. And so, you know, I'd like to be able to make some intelligent, rational decisions about what might be most effective. So that's where I'm coming from when I suggested this be the topic, the Center for South Asia wanted to do something on the earthquake. And this was the question sort of burning a hole in my brain. And I wanted to get sort of a group of people to help me think through it, because um, there's no one answer. And so I'm just going to go through some examples 
of the different things I saw online. So I've not been back to Nepal since it happened. I've sort of watched from afar, and I know many people, of course, who are there. Um, and then our two guests have done very concrete things since it happened, and they're going to reflect on their experiences for us. And I'm just going to go through some examples, sort of generically. So there's different things that so many things happened, right, in terms of the disaster relief, all the things you expect, um, but also in terms of people I knew, academics in country, people outside, you know, you're sending money, right? One of the first things you do is send money, or if you're in the country, you've got boots on the ground, you start doing things. There's web-based technologies. It was just amazing when you look online what happened. I'm going to show some examples about mapping and people sending in reports of how many houses are damaged in very particular villages. And Nepal is really special in a way because it's a small country with a lot of people who've either been tourists there or expats who have connections to particular villages. So as soon as it happens, was the village that I know affected? Okay, the 10,000 that I can raise from my friends is going straight to that village. So I think Nepal is very probably different than many places in that way, too, just the density of people that have those relationships on the ground. A lot of academics I know wrote opinion pieces. Immediately there were things coming out saying, the aid money has to go to the poorest of the poor. It's got to go to the women. It's got to go to the children. You know, sort of the stuff they know generically from academia, they started applying, but could be kind of unsatisfying, because you're like, how do you do that in a disaster? You look at Katrina. <laughs> 10 years later, and we don't feel like we did a very good job of that, right? So how useful are those kinds of opinion pieces right away? Or what purpose do they serve? In some ways, it's the best time to do it because you have the world's attention. So when you make those points at that point in time, more people you know, might hear it and do something about it. And then one of the more interesting things also might be the long-term opportunities for things like appropriate technology. So people who've done a lot of research on what are the appropriate technologies for Nepal? The disaster hits. They now have a chance, the money, the time, the attention to say, okay, we have an answer. Look, we built this house 10 years ago and it survived the earthquake and no other house in this village did. So people were holding up these examples of things they'd done to say this is appropriate technology for earthquakes for Nepal and this is an opportunity over the long term to do some, you know, some proactive things. So a lot of things were going on. So here's some pictures. Like I said, for the people in Nepal, this is what disaster relief looked like. This is a, a friend from South India who's married to the Fulbright director, Lori Vasily. He and just a bunch of people in Kathmandu had a sense of purpose all of a sudden, right? They just got trucks and trucks and trucks you know, from Kathmandu taking food out, taking equipment out, anything they could, they could get their hands on there trying to get it out to the, the communities who needed it. And they were very organized because of social media and ways that you could communicate you know, through cell phones and the web to try and do that. It'll be interesting to see, I'm sure there'll be studies that try and look at how effective it really was. For people who weren't in Nepal at the time but decided they wanted to go back, you know, the relief could look like this. <laughs> this is a woman, I blacked out her name because I don't know her personally. She was linked by someone else on Facebook. And her stories on Facebook were about, you know, two or three days after the earthquake, sitting in the, in the Bangkok airport with like 30, you know, REI tents or something trying to get them into Nepal. And this was her what she wanted, this was it, right? Three days and she's trying to get the Thai airlines to not charge her extra baggage. There's just so many posts about Thai airlines is charging extra baggage to take medicines and tents in. So for some people, this is what it looked like, just trying to get some supplies in and, and maneuver through the bureaucracy and, and try to make that affordable to do. And then the technology was just, I was blown away by it. There's um, so many websites where people, um, you know, crowdsourcing where anyone could, let's see, this one is the Digital Globe, and I don't know any of these in particular, this is just me looking online at all the different things, um, and any of these you can contribute to, so if you got a phone call from a friend or you knew something, you could send information about a particular point on the map and they would upload the data, and so this unfortunately doesn't have a legend, but it sort of shows you in, in Kathmandu areas that were damaged in different ways, like what was the extent, how many houses, so this is all crowdsourced online that you could look at. This is micro-mapping, where they had people go in, so again, you could, they had you know, up-to-date satellite maps, and volunteers were being assigned maps anywhere in the world who wanted to participate, and looking to see if they could see you know, destroyed houses, roads that were out, and they're mapping everything. So anyone in the world could participate, say, I want to help do this, and you could start micro-mapping based on these satellite maps that you know, Google and every, you know, Google and it was giving out for free, people started handing out so that this could happen. And I think maybe, so Facebook people probably heard too, they have that system for disasters where you can post whether you're safe or not, right? So that was all happening too. Um, you know, the crowdsourcing for, for funds, right? So there's, seven million was raised just on this GoFundMe, 1,700 campaigns, you know, just for Nepal relief efforts. The amount of money was amazing. And we were just talking, the, the four billion that was officially, you know, bilateral, multilateral lateral aid to Nepal still hasn't even begun to be dispersed. They haven't done anything with it. So all the money so far has been, you know, funding like this and money that was already, you know, sitting there in country or USA directly put out through their pro programs or something. 
Here's another one, uh, quakemath.org. And this shows you, let's see, what is this one showing? Again, they have all these reports that people were sending in about what happened in particular villages. And so like for this spot, there's 22 reports that got sent in about damage or what kind of food was needed, if people needed tents, sort of what the need was. And then so the people I showed the photos getting trucks out, they could look at you know maps like this and try to coordinate, well, who should go where, what villages have been reached, what villages still have needs. So it's, it's pretty amazing. I don't know how organized it all was from the top down, right? It's all sort of bottom up, so maybe, maybe uh, someone else in the room, because there's people here with a lot of Nepal experience other than the three of us, so maybe, maybe one of you guys know more about how well those worked. And here's an example of those, those reports. You can click on any of these and see what the report was exactly. And then, the, the, like I said, the op-ed pieces that people wrote. So, you know, it's pretty, a lot of language that we've all seen over the years about how we need to do development work, how we need to do political work, what we need to do you know, to make the systems work better. And it all comes out again in a time like this. And then very personal ways of dealing with it. So Kevin, um, Kevin Rubisky is was Peace Corps in the 70s and is a photographer who's gone back. And so in this New York uh, Times piece, he finally went back after a few months and just sort of bore witness through the thing that he does best, right? He's a photographer, so this was his way of going back and, and dealing with the disaster and contributing in some way was just to, to capture it you know, through his own, his own lens. So, you know, in the big picture, we all know relief is problematic, right? And no matter what we do, there's often something that didn't quite work <coughs> the way we expected. And I want to give one example of like boots on the ground. Um, you know, so in general, when we give money, we know there's problems. I have a friend who, going out to a village, a village he knew for a friend who was from the village. We all have stories like this. They get the trucks out there. It's a you know hour or two walk up the hill. They've got a call and um, get someone to come down to carry the stuff up. Well, who do they end up calling? They call the guy's friends, right? His family. That's the only people they have phone numbers for. So who do they pay to carry that stuff up? His friends. Who does the stuff get distributed to? How is someone going to keep track? Is it going to the poorest of the poor? Is it going to, you know, what we would consider? And does it matter? You know, he's there on the ground going, I'm thinking about these issues. I know. I've learned these are important. But, you know, when a whole village is flattened, who's the most needy? Right? Who should it go to first when no one has a house and no one has shelter? Am I gonna, is there a process I can use to do this better as just an individual who's volunteering? So you know, at every scale, these, these issues are, are important and yet not something we can always do anything about and can often you know, make us feel like our hands are tied a little bit. So again, the thinker versus the doer, right? If you think about these things, it can be hard to know what to do. And sometimes it's better just to be a doer, maybe. So I'm going to go on to the, our next two friends here to talk. And these are just, I just want to throw up some questions about, you know, I wanted to hear other people's experiences and reactions to disaster and what they've done in the paths they've chosen. What do you think has been most helpful? We tried to get actually some disaster relief people here to, to talk with us who might actually know what's most helpful for people like us to do who have some expertise but not maybe in relief. Um, but we were unable to. Uh, so we have to share our own group collective experiences here. And uh, you know, what should we advise others to do? Your thoughts and proce you know, processes, how you think about this. And then I just want to say, I know there's no answer, right? This is different for all of us. Like I said, we all react in different ways and feel the need to do different things. But this is just a, a discussion about it. OK, that's all I have. Uh, thank you so much, Terry, uh, for that um, uh, nice uh, general conceptual introduction. And it's going to um, work well with my brief presentation because I'm going to go to the very uh, particularistic, uh, so from macro to micro here. And I'm going to give you a brief look at uh, one organization's pivot from an educational mission to uh, uh, disaster relief um, in Nepal. And uh, I want to give you a little bit of background about myself so that you know why I'm talking about this. I first went to Nepal in 1996 uh, for language study and field site selection for uh, a project in cultural anthropology, my dissertation research. I was really fortunate to be awarded a Social Science Research Council pre-dissertation fellowship, so that put me another year in Nepal for language study uh, and history and, and political science and anthropology study. 
I was affiliated with the Cornell Nepal study program uh, for that year and then I liked that program so much I worked for the Cornell Nepal study program for uh, a full school, school year and then I went finally I went back and and did about uh, just over a year's worth of doctoral research field field uh, research for cultural anthropology Currently, uh, as Lolita said, I'm a um, senior project director at the UW Survey Center here on campus, and uh, I'm currently serving on the board of directors uh, and am treasurer of Sarvodia USA. Uh, that's based uh, right here in Madison, and some of you might be already familiar with it. I was invited to uh, join the board of directors by um, uh, the former executive director, Shishir Kanal. And Shishir is, some of you might know him, a 20, uh, 2005 UW La Follette School graduate. Um, and he went on to uh, become executive director of, of Sarvodia USA until 2012. And um, he had uh, uh, experience working in 2004 and later uh, with the tsunami disaster relief. Uh, and then uh, in 2010, uh, after the earthquake in Haiti, Servo Servodia USA helped uh, with that as well. And uh, I really admired Shishir's work, I really admired his vision, and so I was initially reluctant to join the board. Um, I thought, you know, what could I offer uh, as primarily an academic at that time, and uh, would I have time to do any of this? Um, but because of Shishir's uh, work and because of the larger uh, social movement that Sarvodia represents, uh, I, I, I decided to say yes. Um, Sarvodia USA is the U.S. representative of, uh, an organ of a Sri Lankan-based organization, Sarvodia, which is the NGO representative of something that is properly characterized as a social movement in Sri Lanka. The NGO has a uh, presence in, I think at its zenith, about 15,000 Sri Lankan villages, a staff of over 1,500. Uh, I think it's the longest serving, um, largest NGO in Sri Lanka and has been instrumental in the changes that we've seen in Sri Lanka uh, over the past 50 years. It was founded in 1957. A Gandhian style people's movement dedicated to nonviolence and empowerment just has a wide array of uh, programs there. Um, so this is all part of a movement. There's USA presence, Sri Lanka presence, and um, in 2012, Shishir, my friend Shishir, returned to Nepal to establish Teach for Nepal. And this is an educational uh, reform movement affiliated with the larger Sarvodaya movement. Um, education reform in Nepal is sorely needed. 70% of students drop out before uh, <coughs> reaching the end of their coursework. Uh, in the 10th grade is the last grade in Nepal. And of students who take the uh, nationwide uh, school leaving certificate, uh, SLC exam, only 50% uh, pass that exam. And there's a huge disparity between private and public. Um, there, 90% of private school students pass the SLC, whereas only 30% of public school students pass the SLC, which is roughly equivalent to our high school diploma. And without that, your chances for upward mobility are extremely limited in Nepal. So the, the educational system is very much uh, in need of reform. And this is where Teach for Nepal comes in. Um, it's modeled after Teach for America, which as you all know, tries to recruit uh, uh, you know, the best and the brightest from, uh, uh, from the undergraduate institutions. Um, the uh, Teach for Nepal recruits from Nepal, India, Bangladesh, and Sri Lanka. Uh, in a very wide range of, of bachelor's degrees disciplines. And since 2012, uh, Teach for Nepal has recruited, trained, and placed 87 teaching fellows in 28 public schools serving about 112 villages. Uh, so there's been two cohorts. They've been working, the fellows have been working for two school years now. Uh, so it's, it's very new. It started scale small. It wants to scale up later. Um, and each uh, fellow serves a two-year stint. They work full-time. Um, and uh, so far, the uh, efforts have been extremely successful. The 2015 SLC exam results, which were released at just in June, 73% uh, of TFN fellows uh, students pass, compared with 33% of public school students nationwide. And the first division passes almost doubled uh, in and Teach for Nepal's 28 schools from 82 in 2014 to 150 in uh, 2015. So there's lots more indices to talk about, but um, 
the success so far has been uh, very good. Now, the earthquakes occurred uh, in, in April 25 and May 12 were the big ones, lots of aftershocks uh, in the areas that uh, are served by Teach for Nepal, so where the schools are, sort of the northeast of Kathmandu uh, and south of Kathmandu. The first cohort of TFN fellows were, uh, were just about to complete their uh, two-year service. The loss of life in those areas was extremely high. As Terry mentioned, between 8,500 and 9,000 nationwide. This area was extremely hard hit. Uh, in the area served by TFN, you know, in the scores, uh, certainly probably in the hundreds. The Teach for Nepal fellows were reporting about 70% of the buildings were damaged or destroyed where they were working, so including the schools. Teaching had to stop. And uh, one TFN fellow did uh, perish, and another was injured. The uh, Teach for Nepal mobilized its uh, fellows, all of its fellows, and its entire organization to aid the disaster relief. And this wasn't, uh, in my opinion, an organization that was in seek of a mission. Uh, teaching had to stop. It could no longer do what its mission was, but rather an organization that was extremely well-placed and well-trained uh, and well-equipped to turn really on a dime and aid in this effort. Shishir, with his background in disaster relief, the uh, first year uh, cohort um, uh, with two years in the villages. They live in these small places. They're very familiar with the people there. And so they had a lot to contribute. Uh, they started to work immediately, of course, as just any human would to help. Um, organizationally, though, Teach for Nepal achieved food security in its villages with, within days of the first earthquake, uh, which was a significant accomplishment. And within weeks, had a, a proposal, a plan in place to provide um, uh, temporary shelter, basic supplies throughout uh, the 112 villages it serves, which is about 50,000 people. And that plan is yet to be fully implemented. Uh, the money, more money is needed, but they uh, have been making a lot of headway. As soon as the uh, earthquakes hit, donations began pouring into Sarvodia USA. That's the organization that I volunteer for here. It's based in Madison. Um, we were just tons of individual donations, tons of checks uh, coming in, tons of PayPal uh, donations. We had people uh, in, in California, in Michigan, and elsewhere, uh, individuals, some of whom I noted had Nepali names, uh, but I don't know personally, just taking it upon themselves to organize fundraisers, sell books, whatever it took to raise $700, $1,500, $2,000. Those were pouring in. We were contacted by a very large number of, of workplace giving programs, so people, employees in places like The Gap and Microsoft and Vanguard Charities, um, you know, asking their companies to match their donations, seeking us out, uh, and uh, finally, you know, foundations like the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation uh, seeking us out to, to give us substantial donations as well. To date, uh, we've collected 150,000, uh, and we've been able to transfer all of that to uh, Teach for Nepal directly in, in real, uh, you know, in very short order. And this, compared with what Terry was noting about the government not being able yet to spend 4.1 billion dollars in bilateral and multilateral aid, is extremely telling. Here's an organization that just pivoted and has been very effective, in my opinion. Um, longer term, with more money, Teach for Nepal is. Uh, planning to help rebuild the schools that were damaged or destroyed, and the fellows uh, will be trained to provide psychosocial counseling to those who, who are in grief uh, about their losses. And, um, you know, for me, this what Terry was talking about, the spectrum of responses here. I started out as, you know, someone who studied development academically. I embraced the critiques. I think that they're very important. For me, this was, a, this was uh, an emotional experience. And just having the outlet to do something was extremely helpful to me because if I hadn't made this decision several years ago to get involved, I was initially reluctant, I, I wouldn't have. Um, uh, I, I wouldn't have had the opportunity to, to be doing some, some of this, this work uh, in the last few months, and I don't know what I would have done. I would have been seeking something to do to help. And I, we need the studies later. We need the criti critique later of, of this and everything. Uh, but uh, development, but uh, this, uh, for me, was a very personal um, uh, experience. And I was very touched, I'll end here uh, with uh, something that was shared with me. Uh, it's an open letter to um, uh, Teach for Nepal and the school where uh, uh, a man 
uh, a father, uh, his son perished in the quake. He wrote to the school and Teach for Nepal said, you know, my son was killed, uh, he won't be returning to school, but I, um, as a low caste person, was surprised and very grateful to have received um, Teach for Nepal supplies and, and things that we really needed to, to get through. So uh, as one little um, uh, thing that, that touched me about uh, the effects that they're having there. So with that, I will uh, thank you very much for uh, being here. And if you want to know more, um, these are the organizations, Sarbodia USA, Teach for Nepal, and there's my contact information as well. Thank you very much. Could you put that back up, please? So the, just click, click on that. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah, and I think Ken's example is interesting because I think a lot of we are seeing disaster relief in many ways is moving towards sort of groups like this who can pivot, who can get in there fast, and with the way technology works now, it's so much easier to do that, right? So it's one way disaster relief is changing. Are you, did you get that, Paul? Then are you okay? Yeah. Okay. And I think we're going to Okay, there we go. Thank you. Thank you, Terry. Thank you all for being here. Uh, my name is Sweta Shrestha, and I um, was born and raised in Nepal, so this is something that hits really, I mean, as close to home as it gets, I guess. So it is something that I still struggle trying to, you know, put, figure out what to say and what not. Um, so bear with me as I kind of go through that. Um, so I want to start with a story. It was 1934, and a little girl hurt her toe during a big earthquake, and her dad picked her up and ran outside. At that time, there was no health post or anything like that, and this was Gorka, which was the current epicenter. Um, that little girl was my grandmother, and for the next 79 years of her life, she talked about that earthquake, the big one. And I don't know how badly she injured her toe then, but it was bad enough that she talked about it a lot. So the idea of that big earthquake was always something that was in my head. And over the last five years, I've worked at the Global Health Institute with the undergraduate certificate, leading a group of students to Nepal, my home in many ways, and really seeing a transition after a conflict and also teaching students about global health. So. People knew that the big one was coming. It was, in one way, waiting for that. You know, it was the calm before the storm. But at the same time, people's memories were really fickle. And with the civil war, a lot of people moved into Kathmandu. And, and the city just grew and grew and grew. And the spaces, the open spaces, um, grew less and there were less uh, open space. And um, buildings became taller. There, uh, everyone knew that Nepal was in a seismic activity zone. Growing up there, I went through a couple earthquakes, but they were never that big. But it, everyone knew that, but it's easy to forget how bad it can be or really wrap your head around how strong a big earthquake is. So Nepal is a combination of these really, really old ancient temples. A lot of you probably saw pictures of buildings like this that collapsed. This one collapsed. This was in Paktapur. And also, Nepal also in the mountains are these really ancient looking buildings that have been there for many, many years and these communities that have endured these harsh weathers in the mountains. And this area was really uh, badly hit during the second earthquake that had its epicenter in the Everest region. And what really struck me when I was thinking about uh, the earthquakes was I was supposed to when it happened, I was supposed to be up in the mountains two weeks later, and then two weeks after, or three weeks after that, a group of students, we were supposed to be there. So when you have that earthquake happening so close to you being there, your own mortality, you kind of think about uh, what that means. And then every year we were there with students, we would use Nepal as an example to talk about this, getting ready for disasters, what that means. Where would you run? Where would you hide? 
where, is there a safe place, or are, would you really be putting yourself in danger when you have when you're actually seeking shelter? And another thing that's been going on in Nepal has been this degradation of the environment. Where this is Shikarpa, one of the villages that we work really closely with, and over the past years they've been really stripping the mountain down and getting gravel to make cement. So we talked about it every year, talking about, okay, if an earthquake hits, landslides, what's going to happen? And this is not that far outside of Kathmandu. <coughs> In my mind, this is Nepal. It's the hills. It's geographically really, really challenging. It's one of those places where going 10 kilometers can take a whole day. And one of my students very eloquently put that Nepal has an epidemic of stairs, <laughs> and I have to agree with that. It's just... If there is no flat, it's always up. Uh, and you, you think that there is downhill has to be around the corner somewhere, but no, 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 not really. So the earthquake hit on our Friday midnight, which was their Saturday midday. And if you think about it, and I really didn't wrap my head around how lucky that was, because Nepal, Sunday is a work day, and school occurs on Sunday too. So Saturday is the only day that students aren't in school. And considering that 70% of schools were destroyed, there, it was the fact that it was that one day was extremely, extremely lucky. And I was there this summer and got to see a lot of these schools. And it was just, I couldn't, you, you know, I don't know if you want to say lucky, but we were really, really lucky that this one didn't hit when it, yeah. d that it hit when it did. And um, I remember being woken up with a phone call that Friday night because my sister, who's in California, was Skyping with a friend in Nepal when it happened. So that second that earthquake hit, I knew. And I, in, you, know, you, you just think, oh, a small one. It's not a big deal. But by the next morning, I knew it wasn't a small one. And then became the frantic trying to find friends. And we had students and other students and... Um, just trying to figure out what was going on and um, technology was really really helpful in many ways checking in people Facebook's I'm safe or whatever that check-in status was uh, so that people could get online remarkably and at least let you know that they were safe uh, fiber and Twitter all helped with that as well and this is so thankfully my entire family was okay they were traumatized um, they were still, there was a lot of aftershocks, but they were okay. This is my family uh, the year before we were celebrating New Year, Nepali New Year. The other people I was really worried about were the communities that I worked with. Um, so Shishir Kanal, who we, with Sarvodaya, we, con we partnered with them for our field course. So I was in c uh, contact with him pretty immediately. And we knew that uh, Shikarpa, one of the villages that we've worked with for many years, was almost completely destroyed. And then it was waiting to see how many people we knew, I knew, that were killed. Um, the top picture is uh, my guide and my porters for, from when I went in, uh, in the Annapurna region, region. And I knew that all of them were from the Gorkha region, where the epicenter was. So it took me three days to get a hold of them which was an absolute nightmare because knowing that they're from there, they're either in the mountains where there was an avalanche or they're in the village where there was a landslide and destroyed almost anything, everything. But thankfully they were safe. And um, one of the teacher in Nepal uh, fellow perished during the earthquake and she was part of our group uh, the year before and a lot of the students here knew her very well. And just as the days went on and the pictures started rolling in, of these temples that I grew up around, I played around, and every year I would take students because this is, you know, even with all the pollution, even with all the bad things when you go to Nepal and frustrations, this for me is the core of what, what's beautiful, the artisans, the, the, just the <coughs> history. And then all these pictures from the rural villages where there used to be, there used to be a city here. It's, it's just rubble. And that was extremely hard. And trying to be here and seeing all this come in. And um, so this is Sindhupalchok, one of the worst hit areas where, and this is where uh, I took this picture when I was there. And it's hard to wrap your head around how strong an earthquake would have to be to do this kind of damage. 
I was talking to people, and they talked about the earthquake that they couldn't stand up to, to, to go outside because it was such violent shaking that they just couldn't maintain their balance. Which I still I went through a couple aftershocks when I was there, but it was over before I knew it. So, and this is some pictures of Gorka village, where landslides because of how um, the villages were. Uh, where they were completely destroyed. And this is another picture. And even the homes that looked fine from outside. So this was one of the villages that I went to and did a community assessment. And I had been told that this village wasn't impacted a lot by the earthquake. And when I talked to the people, that no one was living inside their homes. And this was two months after the earthquake. And uh, this was the home of where uh, the doctors and the nurses in the community outreach center lived. And I spent around 30 seconds in that building, and the whole time I was praying there wasn't going to be an aftershock while I was in there, because it was, it, was, it was not safe. So they were sleeping outside or in other buildings because they felt much better. So going back to the psychosocial impact of this. Um, and this is one of the community outreach centers. So this is where my public health brain also was frantically firing because the earthquake wasn't just hitting people, it was hitting communities, it was hitting the already strained public health infrastructure and, it w and the health centers, a lot of which were destroyed. So um, before you even think about the outbreaks of cholera or anything like that that's associated with a disaster, you're thinking about what are the, what are the primary care things that they're not being provided because there's a big disaster like this and the hospitals are inundated by, by broken bones and other uh, traumatic injuries. And then for me, this was another thing that happened was this constant feed of aftershocks. It was every day, almost, and because we're 12 hours different, it was just constant. I, I was not sleeping for many days because of this constant social media presence of the aftershocks. So for me, this whole thing was about finding balance. It was finding a balance between being informed, yet maintaining my sanity, maintaining my own health, my mental health, my physical health, and really checking myself to see where I was during that. So, and that wasn't easy, and it was something I had to do. And I, I'd like to thank the Global Health Institute, which was really, really essential in checking me to make sure I was okay. And because a lot of media wanted to talk to me, a lot of other people wanted, and I just didn't. I still couldn't figure out what I wanted to say or didn't want to say. And you do react really emotionally when it is that close to home. So how do you do that? I don't know. I still am figuring it out. But it was really helpful to have colleagues there to support me and at times really tell me, well, maybe you should, you know, go and take the rest of the day off or, or have a cup of coffee. Maybe that'll help. So um, it was that really finding balance. And then, at, and then I was thinking as I was preparing for this, what did I feel during that weeks of aftershocks and, uh, you know, as the damage and everything was coming in? It was a combination of guilt, of helplessness, not feeling like I didn't have any power to do anything and this powerless feeling because this is so much bigger than I could do anything about so and then I remember distinctively taking a shower and feeling really really guilty about that because people even, even my families were um, were in tents outside and they were too scared to go inside even though they had homes so it was a lot of that and trying to maintain balance in my own life so that I could think clearly about what to do and then also think about the fact that I'm supposed to be there in a couple weeks with students. What do you do? What kind of safety things do you have to think about? In your first instinct is to just get up and go, but then you have to think about, do you take students? Is that even safe? Or do you go yourself? And um, a lot of times when you just pick up and leave and go somewhere where I know a lot of people tend to do that, are you straining the already strained resources? If you don't speak the language, if you're not from there, it takes a lot of effort to host people, as I think a lot of people know. Even here or there, you know, who's gonna pick you up from the airport? Um, do you need a translator? What kind of skills can you give? And also, are you displacing people who already have skills there? So it was, 
it was a lot of questioning like that. So I ended up um, working with Tunic Hill Hospital. It, this hospital is a, one of my uh, partners that I've had for many years. And we, we were going back and forth because we had students and uh, things there during uh, the earthquake and talking to them about their needs. And they invited me to come and help them with some of their programs. This is what the hospital looked like when I got there, but this is what it looked like during right after the earthquake. They, they, the hospital is located about an hour outside of Kathmandu, so they got a lot of the patient um, coming in from Sindhupalchok, which was the hardest hit area. So they, uh, I was really impressed with the work they're doing, like, Sar, uh, like Sarvodaya did a lot, and they were had all the connections in the community, and what was the hallmark of this hospital is that their community outreach centers, and that has been in, these in the hardest hit communities for years. So they were really able to go and, uh, and do things. And another thing, I think, when you have disasters like this, you just hear the bad things, and you don't really hear the communities coming together. And one of the biggest examples of that was that, as in many other countries, when someone gets sick, it's not just the patient who comes to the hospital, it's the entire family. So and especially in a disaster setting, when their homes are gone, there were hundreds and hundreds of people there. Uh, so the Tunicale community fed and housed thousands of people for an entire month um, as they were uh, themselves dealing with the earthquake and, uh, and the damages. And distributing relief was not easy. Nepal being what it is, a lot of landslides, lots of damages, lots of land being shaken from the earthquake, so it was really, really unstable. Um, even landing a helicopter was extremely dangerous. I think a couple of helicopters crashed uh, uh, during the relief efforts. And that does not look stable to me <laughs> at all. Um, but it was interesting to be, when I was there, I'd, I'd never seen that many helicopters flying in my entire life. Just, and, and that was the only way to reach places. And, but are we really reaching all the areas that were hit? Because the earthquake did hit the rural areas. I think people were prepared in the cities, especially, uh, as Terry was saying, the expat community knew it was coming. but. The people, the regular Nepali communities, really didn't even think about it. Uh, I don't think a lot of people had uh, these earthquake preparation kits. It was only the privileged few who did. So people didn't have uh, water or anything like that as they were um, had to evacuate. So some of the relief uh, packages. What I really like about this one was that they made sure to include things like sanitary pads and other things that people don't think about immediately as relief. Yes, they need the tents, but they need these other, other things too, and I like the idea that they put spices in there because Nepali people eat spices in their food. And it doesn't matter if the world is ending, we need our food to taste good. So, um, but it's also, you know, when you go through a disaster and it's traumatic, is why not have the little comforts of home to, uh, if that makes you feel better or it makes it a little better in that day. And um, so a lot of my work when I was there, uh, we were visiting community health centers. This is uh, the pharmacy area uh, because there were so many aftershocks, people were in and out, so there was no organization or anything uh, to the materials, unfortunately, and they had to evacuate because their other building, which was my first slide, was completely destroyed. And people's... Uh, even though they weren't physically injured in the earthquake, a lot of them had were really traumatized, and I think that's uh, everyone in Nepal, even in Kathmandu or in the villages, that they were, and their trauma was being um, presented in different things. A lot of people were coming in with aches and pains that didn't really exist, and that was to get their health checked out to make sure they're okay. Every person I talked to. Now you talk, you say hello, how are you, all that thing, and then you talk about, is your family okay after the earthquake? So the discourse has really changed, and I think because of the earthquake, how the younger generation, uh, what they see uh, as, the, as they move on with the future has also changed. So a lot of things has changed in Nepal because of this earthquake, and, but I was really impressed with 
the youth really rallying and community organizations like Sarvodaya really gathering all these people, even though they were traumatized themselves, to help others and help communities. And lastly, I'd like to end with the story of this old gentleman who we met in Sindhu Palchok. Um, he's here with my sister, um, who's a doctor. Um, he, his wife, it was, the earthquake ha happened in the middle of the day, and his wife was, went to water the buffalo in the, in the sh uh, shed, and uh, both the buffalo and his wife um, died in the earthquake. And he talked about how he lost everything. And um, he was going to li go live with his daughters, which in the Nepali culture, you just don't do. Um, and, um, but he was really, really strong on you know, accepting life as it is and then moving on and saying how lucky he was that he still had his daughters and that he could go with them. And in the end, he just wanted to be checked out one more time to make sure there was nothing wrong with him. But I think when you are dealing with disasters like that, it's as important to think about the, the good things and the strength uh, in people, because it's so easy to just get overwhelmed and bogged down by the not so good things and the stories that make you cry. Um, so that is what I'll end with. Thank you. Thank you.